Well, I want to start this morning by speaking about music. Now, normally, I like speaking about decent music. What I mean by that is bands like The Stone Roses, Happy Mondays, Oasis, good stuff. But, just for a moment, I'm going to speak about Harry Styles. <laughs> Earlier this year, as some of you probably know, because you are there, Harry Styles played Murrayfield Stadium. None of the men are nodding their head, but some of you, I'm sure, were there. My wife and my daughter went. Just to be very clear, I didn't. <laughs> when they got back, I got the full rundown. They told me uh, what songs he did. They spoke about the atmosphere. They said it was absolutely brilliant. And I got shown more than a few of the videos that they'd taken. Now, one thing I remember in seeing the videos and, and hearing the feedback was how varied the crowd was. There was old people, there was young people, there was men, women, children, there was people from Edinburgh, people from Glasgow, people from England, people from Holland, people from all over had come to this concert. Now just imagine for a moment that you are the brother or the sister of Harry Styles. Uh, you turn up at the gate and you try and get through the turnstile. You shout someone over and tell them that, that Harry Styles is your brother. You pull out your phone, you show them photos, you show them your ID, you even try and get your mum on the phone, but the guy in the door, he's, he's not interested. He simply looks at you with a frown and says, no ticket, no entry. The fact is your brother actually means nothing as far as that concert's concerned. There was only one way into the stadium and everyone who had the right ticket got in. So as far as this concert's concerned, you are an outsider. This morning's sermon is all about insiders and outsiders. Insiders and outsiders when it comes to the family of God. Now as we walk through the passage this morning, we're going to be thinking about who is on the inside and who is on the outside. We're going to see how someone can move from the outside to the inside. And then we're going to think a little about what difference being on the inside should make to our lives. Now as we start out here, we see that Jesus is still speaking to the people. And from the way the story unfolds, and as we look at the first verse of the next chapter, I think we can rightly assume that Jesus is speaking inside a house. So already in the picture, already in this scene, we've got people who are on the inside of the house. And we've got people who are on the outside of the house. As Jesus' family turn up, they are on the outside. Look again at verses 46 and 47. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside, wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside, wanting to speak to you. And we see the reply. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Pointing his to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Now you may know that in Jewish culture, families were really, really tight. Families looked out for each other. They protected each other. They, they had each other's back. So what Jesus seems to be saying here about his family, it almost sounds scandalous. Because not only are Jesus' family outside of the house, they were also on the outside spiritually. In comparison, Jesus points at his disciples and says, these people, unlike my family, these people are on the inside. These people, my disciples, are my true family. Now, Jesus' family had spent many years with him. 
They'd shared many dinners, had many conversations, but Jesus' own family missed the point. They missed who he really was. They missed that he was the Son of God. They were on the outside. And listen, many people make the same mistake today, don't they? I'm sure all of us have met people who who say that they're Christians, but they haven't got a clue. Some people think they're Christians because their mum or their dad's a Christian. They think that they're going to make the grade because their mum or dad's got a plus one. Some think that they're part of the family of God because they go to church. Others think that they're they're going to get in because they see themselves as good. Some reckon that they're an insider because, well, they know a lot about the Bible. But we need to know something. Family, it's not enough. Status isn't enough. Power and influence aren't enough. Having the right connections isn't enough. Even having the right theology isn't enough. None of these things can take us from the outside to the inside. So as you've seen as we, as we work through Matthew's Gospel, we see that Jesus' mother and brothers were on the outside. The Pharisees, who certainly thought they, that they were on the inside, they were on the outside. The scribes were on the outside. The religious leaders were on the outside. But Jesus points at his disciples. And he says, here are my mother and brothers. These people, they are on the inside. They are my true family. So all of that being true, we need to ask that really, really important question. How can you get from the outside to the inside? Put another way, how can someone become part of of Jesus' family. Have a look again at verse 50. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now I think we need to say something at the start now. We need to look at and understand at least what this verse is saying but also what this verse isn't saying. This verse is saying That Jesus' family do the will of God. This verse is not saying that someone is saved by works. How does that help us? How on earth can a sinner do the will of God? How can someone move from being a rebel against God and become an insider in Jesus' family? Well, let me throw another few verses into the mix. From John 6, 27, Jesus says this. He says, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, To believe in the one he has sent. A few other verses. Mark 1, 15. Jesus says, The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And later in Romans, Paul writes this in chapter 10. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So we want to put all of that together. And this is what we'll see. Someone who's in the family of Jesus is someone who's heard the gospel, who's repented of their sin, who's placed their faith in Jesus, and who has daily taken up their cross and following him. The person who's on the inside is the person who, having been saved, no longer lives for themselves, 
but does the will of God. They don't do it perfectly, but what God wants is what they want. And if you look at their lives, you're going to see fruit in keeping with repentance. As you look at that person, there's a, there's a difference, there's a, there's a family likeness. I wonder, like me, if you've watched the Tyson Fury documentary on Netflix. I think I'm in my third watching of it now. If you watch that program, you're going to see a family likeness, aren't you? You're going to see the, the Fury family likeness. Tyson Fury looks like his dad, doesn't he? He looks like his dad. He acts like his dad. He sounds like his dad. He speaks like his dad. And if you look at Tyson Fury's oldest son, he's exactly like his dad. He's exactly like his granddad. There is a family likeness. In Jesus' family, there's a family likeness. We do God's will, not our own. His work is seen in our lives. Now the question we need to ask this morning now, having heard that, is this. Are you an insider or an outsider when it comes to Jesus' family? Now earlier in this chapter, in chapter 12, Jesus has made it clear that judgment is coming. And the bottom line is this. The judgment that's coming is going to be far worse than getting stuck outside of a Harry Styles concert. Because all of those on the outside are going to hell. That's what the Bible says. After that, there's no way back. There's no way back. It's too late to change your mind. The door is closed, it's locked, and no key can ever get you back in. But today, today, there is a way. And it's not found in money, and it's not found in people or status, it's not found in family background, it's not found in church attendance, it's certainly not found in any good thing that you think you can do. It's found through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Now I'm sure you've heard that on the cross, Jesus Christ died for sin. Jesus Christ took upon himself the punishment and the judgment that we deserve. And today, today, whoever... Listen, I'm a Calvinist. But I'm going to say that word again. Whoever calls upon the name of Jesus will be saved. God's family is open to whoever. Whoever. Jew and Gentile. Men, women, children, rich and poor. West or east. North or south. Listen, even Glaswegians can become part of God's family. Don't be so close to the family that you end up missing out. Some people have been coming to church all their life. They know the gospel. They can tell you the gospel. They spend time with Christians, but deep down, when they're by themselves, when all the sound is gone and there's no distractions and they're just sitting there deep down, they know, maybe you know, that actually you're on the outside. I would say to you this morning, if that's you and just now you're in the same position as Jesus' mother and brothers and sisters were. Learn from them. They were once on the outside. But by the start of the book of Acts, we discover that they'd become believers. 
we discover that they moved from being on the outside to being believers and part of Jesus' true family on the inside. So don't look to anything other than Jesus to save you. Put your trust in him. Cross over from death to life and start living according to God's will and not your own. Now before we finish today, we want to think about what difference all of this should make to those of us who are insiders. To those of us who are part of Jesus' true family. What difference should this make to our lives, especially when it comes to the will of God? Now as we saw just a moment or two ago, verse 50 speaks about doing. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now, before I became a Christian, I thought Christianity was all about rules and regulations. And to be honest, I think a lot of Christians think that as well. For many, Christianity is all about duty. It's all about works. Now, to be sure... It involves that. But let me tell you something that I'm sure you know already. Being comes before doing. Being comes before doing. Putting that a different way. It's only being in Christ that we can live for Christ. It's only being in Christ that enables us to even attempt to do the will of God. But more than that, it's truly being in Christ that makes us want to do the will of God. And I want to pick up on that last point for a moment and speak about motivation. What motivates us to do the will of God? And I think the answer is this. The love of God motivates us to do the will of God. Knowing who God is, knowing what God has done, knowing that God loves us, it deepens, doesn't it? It deepens and widens and strengthens our love for him. You are not going to do the will of God because someone's standing before you this morning saying, do the will of God. But you will do the will of God when you start to understand How much God loves you. From that comes the motivation and the desire to do God's will. Now, of course, there are are many challenges to that, aren't there? I know from my own experience that in my sinful arrogance, even though I know God's will is good, pleasing and perfect, there are times that I choose to do things my way. Times when I think where where my words, where my actions would suggest that I think I know what's best. We all have times, don't we, when we say, I want things my way. Which means we don't want things God's way. There are times when our friends tell us all the kinds of things that we want to hear, that they know us, that they're there for us, that they'll stick by us, and there are times when old friends invite us to do things that we know we shouldn't do, they invite us to go places that we know we shouldn't go to, and we end up listening, and we end up in a right mess. We forget who we are. And what happens is we start living like we're on the outside, not on the inside. When that happens, what we need to do is we need to own that. We need to confess and we need to repent. So so one of the action points this morning for you is maybe that is where you are this morning. And the word of God would call you to confess and repent. But if we're kind of going along nicely this morning, if we're we're in a good place this morning, let's praise God for that. 
let's make sure we, we hear the warning and we avoid those kind of mistakes. How do we do that? Well, I think it's quite simple. If we would avoid those mistakes, we will do well to remember that Jesus tells us who we are. We are his. We are on the inside. This morning, if you're a Christian, Jesus points at you and he says, you are my mother and my brothers. You are my family. You are on the inside. Please hear that. The one who has defeated sin and death and the evil one, the one who has all authority, the one who sits at the right hand of the Father and reigns, he points to us and says, you are mine. You are my family. I remember at school, a couple of my mates, crazy mates to be fair, they decided it would be a good idea to become blood brothers. I've got no idea where the idea came from. Presumably they'd watch a film or some daft thing. So they cut their hands open with a knife, mixed their blood, and thought they were brothers for life. Joined his family. Utter nonsense. But we've been bought with blood. We've been bought by Jesus' blood. He has given his life for us. He has saved us. And the Bible says that we've been joined to him. And the Bible also says that because we've been joined to him, we've been joined to each other. Not through mixing our blood, but through Jesus' blood. The Bible tells us that, that nothing, if you're a Christian, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And so our identity, it's not where we come from. It's not in our earthly family. It's certainly not in our football team, something I need to remind myself of often. It's not in anything else. If you're a Christian, your identity and my identity is found in Jesus Christ alone. And that is such a basic thing to say. But I can tell you in over what, 17 or 18 years of pastoral ministry, the biggest mistake I've seen people make time and time again, one of the biggest causes of people entering into sinful patterns is that they've simply forgotten who they are. They've forgotten that their identity is in Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, please let me say that again. Your identity is in Jesus Christ. And he says to us, we're his family. We have a closeness and an intimacy with him that is more wonderful, that is more incredible, that is more precious, that is more life-transforming than anything this world can offer us. And how easily we forget that. The king of the universe says to us, to those who are Christians, you are mine. I don't know about you, but I can find that my heart can be so hard. But that truth that we've just considered, it softens it. That truth causes my love for Jesus to grow. It causes my desire to serve him to grow. It's, it enables me to want to do his will. That truth helps me to want to put Jesus first in everything. And make no mistake, that is one of the main applications for us this morning as his children. As children of God, put Jesus first. Now, if you're a Christian, let me tell you this. I know for certain that you'll agree with that. There is no Christian who would disagree with that. Are we? That's a question we need to, to answer. Are we putting Jesus first? And when we hear that Jesus calls and saves sinful reptiles like us, and he calls us family, we'll want to put him first. 
We'll want to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. We will want to live a life that pleases God. We will want to honour him in all that we do. We will want to make much of Jesus and not ourselves. We will want to obey him because he points at us. And he says, you are my family. You are on the inside. And so today and this week, as we are tempted to listen to the voices which would try and pull us away from Jesus, and let me say, your own voice is always going to be the most dangerous. Let's look to Jesus. When we're tempted to give in to old habits, when we're tempted to go our own way, just remember Jesus points to us and says, you are my family. Let me say one more thing about family. It might be that you've come here this morning and you've had a really bad experience of family. And all this talk about family is actually really difficult for you. Some of us may have experienced horrendous abuse. And just talking about family, it brings up memories, tough memories, things you're maybe still struggling with today. Maybe your experience of family has always been one where you've been made to feel on the outside. People have told you that you're useless, that, that you're a waste of space. Maybe you've had the kind of cruel family who essentially have given you a ticket for a Harry Styles concert and they've snatched it off you and ripped it up in your face. And you find it hard to trust family. You find it hard to believe in your family. And listen, there's, there's nothing I can say this morning that's going to take the reality of that pain and hurt and suffering away. Nothing I can say. But I will say this. What we're talking about this morning can start to bring peace and start to bring comfort into your situation. In Christ, you're part of a new family. A new family. A great preacher from Aberdeen once said this, and obviously you've heard me now this morning, I'm not quoting myself. He says this. He says, blood may be thicker than water, but spirit is thicker than both. I think it's a great saying. What he means is simply this. As Christians, we've been joined to Jesus. We've been joined to each other. And at Grace Mount Community Church here, you're a family. You're part of a great family. Now, you're not perfect, like us at Midri. <laughs> you're not perfect, neither are we. You're going to make mistakes as we do. You're going to get annoyed with each other, frustrated with each other, but the simple truth is this, Jesus is with you and he is for you and he is working in you and he points at you today if, you, if you're a Christian and he says you are mine. And one day with all believers across the world and across all time, we will be presented to Jesus not as an imperfect family, but as a family without spot and without blemish. Because listen, one day, our battle with sin is going to be over. Death's going to be gone. Mourning is going to be gone. Pain gone. And all will be well. But I'll simply say this in closing. Until then, Jesus reminds us that we're his family now, tomorrow, and always, we are on the inside, and Jesus has got our backs. Amen. Amen.